welcome you all to today's session which deals with DIC that is disseminated intravascular coagulation I thank you all of you for such an overwhelming re response to our videos but we would like to know more uh, about it so do uh, give your suggestion comments how do you like the videos uh, and don't forget to again like share and subscribe to our channel Fine. so let us start with today's session so DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation it is actually a very complex disease why because in that you will see thrombosis as well as hemorrhages both and this is I think is the only one condition in which you can see this combination and that's why we call it as a very complex disease now let us see how it happens <coughs> What happens that due to any stimulus the intrinsic uh, as well as extrinsic intravascular coagulation gets uh, stimulated uh, now that what are the causes of this stimulation that we will see uh, in next uh, slide but just for sake of understanding its uh, pathophysiology let us understand that somehow the intravascular coagulation gets activated via any of this intrinsic as well as extrinsic pathway and obviously when coagulation pathways get activated you will get thrombosis so this is nothing new so there is a thrombotic phase and this thrombotic phase will now consume most of the coagulation factor and that's when the problem starts because consumption of most of the coagulation factor will uh, create a state uh, in which you will have a bleeding or what you can say hemorrhage and during this consumption phase not only the coagulation factor platelet also get consumed so there will be a phase of hemorrhage so you develop hemorrhages secondary uh, fibrino uh, lysis will be initiated the clot will be dissolved and then still it continues in form of hemorrhages and again hemorrhages are dealt by causing more and more uh, coagulation so it is a vicious cycle that thrombosis initiate hemorrhage hemorrhage initiate thrombosis and ultimately it will end up in multi-organ failure and death now what are the most common cause for this condition first is the obstetric cause related to pregnancy uh, the conditions which can cause DIC they are very common second is uh, metastasis that is any malignancy which can initiate uh, this thrombosis which will end up in this condition massive trauma can also cause a disseminated intravascular coagulation and finally bacterial infection especially septicemia so <laughs> infection trauma metastasis and obstetric causes these are the most common causes for DIC now let us see what are the most common sites which are affected uh, in case of DIC where you can see the thrombosis or thrombus formation so the first site which is very common or the most common site is actually the brain followed by heart lungs kidneys and adrenal
followed by liver so brain is the most common site where you can see thrombosis followed by heart and lung if you have to read the top three so as you can see we are only discussing the high yield points which are important from your entrance point of view uh, we will do more detailed uh, discussion of each topic uh, in future sessions so what are the two important endocrine manifestations that you can see in DIC so as you have seen that adrenal is involved so uh, due to adrenal gland thrombosis and hemorrhage it will not work and due to that you will develop Frederick Hossein syndrome pituitary will also be involved and due to uh, pituitary not working or pituitary thrombosis and hemorrhage will end up in pituitary destruction that will lead to Sheehan syndrome and this is actually hyperpituitarism so Frederick Hussein syndrome and Sheehan syndrome they are the two important endocrine manifestation of DIC Now, what are the laboratory investigations and what is what are what they will show us in case of DIC so the first is uh, platelet count and as you know that platelet will be consumed so it is decreased and that due to that there will be increase in bleeding time coagulation factors they also get decreased and that will lead to increased clotting time increased uh, prothrombin time PTT and TT fibrinogen uh, very important indicator uh, that also get decreased this happens in thrombotic phase what happens if a uh, person is in bleeding phase or hemorrhagic phase then fibrinolytic system has been activated so plasmin levels are high fibrinogen degradation products are high what we call as FDP uh, on peripheral smear in case of thrombotic phase you will see micro angiopathic hemolytic anemia and this is due to mainly the thrombosis or uh, which are seen in blood vessels which causes this destruction of RBC uh, so you will see one and torn RBC so various forms of such RBCs like schistocyte spherocyte bar cells helmet cells and other fragile form of RBC are seen so this is in thrombotic phase uh, this was about fibrinolytic phase or secondary fibrinolysis now this uh, fibrinogen uh, that I want to specially emphasize that fibrinogen level has to be monitored why because it is the indicator which will correlate with the bleeding best so it is the best indicator if we want to monitor when bleeding will happen so for fibrinogen is to be monitored now how to treat this condition so treatment of DIC involves
find the cause and treat the cause because even if you treat it with some transfusion or replacement unless and until you uh, treat that cause uh, that replacement is uh, uh, useless so find the cause and if you find that cause is reversible then treat the cause that is the best treatment in case of DIC now what else you can do uh, DIC versus TTP that is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura now sometimes they uh, simulate the condition so here the coagulation factors are low while coagulation factors are actually normal in case of uh, TTP 